Welcome to Thursdays at the Museum. I'm Ian Rapnicki with the DIA. Thanks for joining us for today's program. Before we get started, I wanted to remind viewers in Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb counties that general admission is always free to the museum for residents, so come visit us if you can. Uh, but today's uh, program will be visiting the studio of Jeremy Wheeler, where we'll learn about his artistic practice and we'll get a little demonstration about how to paint Kermit the Frog in watercolor. So that'll be very fun. And if you'd like to leave a comment or ask a question during the program today, you can do so by signing in, making sure you're signed into YouTube if that's where you're watching from. And you can leave a public comment there. If you're watching us via Facebook Live, you can also leave a public comment there and your questions will be fielded by today's host, uh, Zach Freeling, who is the DIA studio coordinator. So without further ado, let's get started by welcoming uh, Zach and Jeremy. Hey. Thanks, Ian. Hey. Yeah. Hey, Jeremy, how's it going? Hey, Zach, how's it going? Good. It's going, going pretty good. Nice sunny day. Happy to have you here. I like seeing this photo of you and the uh, Ooh, window I, of you I, kind of doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. There um, you go. Great. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, before we get started too, I just wanted to mention, and I'll mention it again, um, that this is going to be our, for now anyways, last Thursdays at the museum studio visit as we kind of focus on in-person programming. Um, so thank you for joining. Um, feel free to check out, these are all archived on YouTube. We've got probably two years or so of great artist interviews and demonstrations, all sorts of different techniques. Um, check those out and share them. But today we're going to talk to Jeremy Wheeler um, about watercolor painting. So let's get right into that. And I'm just going to jump ahead to a slide of some of your work here. Um, Ian mentioned Kermit the Frog. So here we have some Muppet watercolors that are very nice. Um, before we get too into this, Jeremy, did you just want to talk a bit about your background, uh, who you are, what you do, where you come from? Yeah. Uh, so I'm Jeremy Wheeler. Uh, I am a local Ann Arbor artist, and uh, I am also the marketing manager at the A2AC, the Ann Arbor Arts Center. And uh, I have been involved with lots of different kinds of events through the years, um, whether it's uh, DJing or doing gig posters uh, for events, doing uh, comics, uh, been dabbling in a lot of different kind of DIY styles and mediums, uh, but watercolors are new for me, uh, new just in the past couple of years. So I'm excited cool. to be uh, showing everybody um, my approach. Cool. Yeah. And I had, um, I've been aware of your poster work and some of your uh, ink work and graphic design work for a while and just sort of noticing you doing these um, watercolor portraits and paintings on a lot of like Instagram, uh, like tutorial, not tutor tutorials, but like a uh, time lapse. Time lapses. Yeah. yeah. A lot of watercolor time lapses. Um, so I've been wanting to have you as a guest for a while to demonstrate. Um, and I did not know at the time that it was uh, new. Um, I thought this was something you'd been doing for a while because they're pretty skillful. Um, noticing a comment from Judy in the chat, is there going to be a tour? Uh, there will be a highlights and history of the DIA tour for the next Thursdays at the museum. Today is just the studio visit with Jeremy, but we will talk a bit about some of the objects from the collection that he is inspired by, um, including some, including uh, the Kermit the Frog puppet from our puppet showcase. But uh, back to these paintings though. So how did you um, get into watercolor? What drew you to it in the past few years? Uh, so when the pandemic hit, one of the things that we did at the A2AC was uh, we were posting some like uh, quick and easy videos uh, for uh, people to do art at home. And a series of videos that were made by my coworker, Ann Arbor artist, Rachel DeRocher, uh, were watercolor, you know, tutorials. And um, because I work marketing, I was the one who was posting them. So, uh, you know, as I was watching them, uh, it really reminded me a lot of ink washes and ink washes. Um, that's a technique where you basically dilute India ink uh, with, you know, various amounts of 
wa uh, water uh, to get a, a range of like grays. And I've done ink washes almost my whole life. So when I started, when I, when I saw some of these watercolor tutorials, I was just like, oh, this is a lot like ink washes, except not quite as permanent. Uh, the thing with ink washes is you, you put those things down and the paper just eats them up and they're, they're set. And what I really was drawn to with watercolor were, was the idea that um, it wasn't so permanent that like you could re-wet uh, certain colors that you put down and you could pull them up and you could uh, you could kind of keep messing with it. And I'd done watercolors in the past. Uh, I went to uh, school at the Art Institute of Pittsburgh and I, I took some watercolor classes and uh, I remember struggling with them at the time. And so I never went back. And so when I started looking at these, studying these like uh, these tutorials, I was just like, oh, why don't I why don't I try that? And, you know, it helps that I was working for an arts institution. You know, I could like talk to people and, you know, see the right kind of um, the, the right kind of tools to get the right kind of paper and stuff. And so then I just started diving in and and then just like posting stuff along the way. Those Muppet uh, pieces that was part, part of like a very uh large collection of Muppets that I painted uh, one year back. Um, I started doing those in October and they kind of uh, continued through last December. And, um, and so I kind of use these series as a way to uh, practice and learn. And, uh, and then it kind of like spiraled into portraiture and uh, so I kind of got caught up in, you know, uh, doing memorial portrait, uh, portraits, um, you know, Sidney Poitier, you know, um, and, uh, and so, yeah, like then I got really hooked on portraiture work too. Um, but I think it helps that I have a background in cartooning. I have a background in, you know, pen and ink. I have a background in a lot of different things. So I'm kind of able to play with, uh, pretty, play pretty loose with style and uh, approach when it comes to this. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's nice seeing all of these together, just seeing all the different, different styles from pretty straightforward, you know, more like a storybook style. And then these more realistic portrait, portraits mm -hmm. and kind of in between. Um, I found too, I was doing a lot of watercolor during, you know, when things were more shut down because also it was compared to, you know, printmaking or encaustic painting or other medias I've done, watercolor is pretty, you know, easy to do in your own space or, you know, if you don't have a big studio or to go out to a park and do it or do it on the beach or whatever. Yeah, like printmaking, like, you know, I had a whole kind of, you know, mini career as a, uh, as a poster artist and I did a lot of screen prints and, mm -hmm. um, my homies at VG Kids and Ypsilanti, yeah. they printed uh, all of my work. And, uh, you know, it was really rewarding. I worked with different galleries like Hero Complex Gallery in LA. And, uh, but screen printing is so precise. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I really loved about watercolor is that I could do it fast. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that I could really pull off with screen printing because uh, in, even when I got a, an iPad and I got a tablet and I started drawing on that tablet, great, that cut down a little bit of time because I wasn't like drawing on paper, inking on paper, scanning it in, then yeah. coloring it and then separating it. Um, but suddenly when I started doing watercolor, I was just like, wow, I could, I could essentially knock a couple watercolors out in a night if I wanted to. Yeah. I could definitely knock out one. And uh, I think that that's been uh, that idea has been more pronounced in the pandemic when after doing a lot of watercolors, I've gone back to do a couple of posters mm. and was really struck by just how long, how labor intensive they were to to do. And mm -hmm. part of it is my fault because I, you know, th that's just the approach that I had always taken. Mm -hmm. But it made me really appreciate watercolors then because I was just like, I I'm kind of going nuts because I could have painted so many watercolors in the time that I was working on just this one poster. Yeah. So 
I, it's it's the perspective is uh, definitely pretty clear for me that um, you know my output is stronger with watercolors and um, I just get so much more out of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of posters, let's jump back in time a little bit. And for those mm -hmm. of you watching, we're gonna look at some work for about the next, you know, usually about half we'll, time we'll be looking at work and then Jeremy will move on to a demonstration. If you have a watercolor set handy, feel free to uh, draw or paint along. But going back to some posters, um, these were from an event um, that you ran called The Bang. Can you tell us a bit about these? And these, these are posters that you made as well. Yeah, yeah. so The Bang was a, uh, a mixtape dance party. Uh, I started it uh, 21 years ago, uh, as of yesterday, uh, with um, uh, my buddy Jason Gibner, who is another Michigan artist. And, you know, we, we, uh, we didn't know how to spin records, you know, we didn't know how to mix or anything like that, but we, we knew how to make mixtapes. And, you know, we were these, you know, kind of idiot indie kids and we were throwing parties in basements and um we eventually 9-11 uh, hit and we kept on we were going over to windsor to a club called the loop to go dancing over there and then when 9-11 hit it was impossible to get across the border and so we started throwing a party in the basement of e squad at u of m at the half the halfway in uh, which was a, a cafe venue space that was run by students. And so we did a couple of bangs there and then we moved to the Blind Pig and we did it for, we threw them for 18 years uh, before we retired them. And uh, we threw over 150 events. Uh, a, the majority of them were themed. Uh, one event we actually threw at the DIA which was interesting. There was live wrestling and live boxing. And uh, I'm still kind of amazed that it happened. That was around 2007 or so. And um, so, yeah, uh, th this is, uh, you know, to talk about the posters on the screen, we have prom bang. Uh, this is a, this is a great example of just, you know, a uh, collage cut and paste, uh, but it's just via the computer. And, um, and then the, other uh the bang must die that's the final um that's the final bang that's the poster for the final bang and oddly enough we um we ended it right before the pandemic hit it was uh, october before the pandemic hit and it was time we were very happy to you know uh you know send it off well and uh yeah i'm really happy of uh all the posters that I made for it, I made every poster for every uh, event. So it's a really, you know, large body of work. Uh, it's almost overwhelming. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and it's cool kind of seeing that that thread from, you know, making uh, artwork for music, promoting music, and then, you know, making artwork based on music or inspired by music. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Speaking of, you've got some other paintings of musicians and things here. We had the Ronnie Spector here, the George mm -hmm. Harrison. Um, does that come about organically as you're listening to something? Do you think like, oh, I should paint this? Or are there specific reasons? Or do you have kind of an ongoing list of, you know, things you want to knock off? Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Yeah. Uh, Ronnie was when when she passed. Right, right. Um, George, uh, and so is Sydney. Uh, George was when Get Back happened, and mm -hmm. uh, when Get Back was released. yeah, and when Get Back was released, and if you remember, it was released just about a year ago. Yeah. yeah. So that was um, I was just coming off of doing a lot of uh, a lot of Muppet um, pieces, and uh, was just you know blown away by Get Back, and and uh, inspired to do versions of you know of the boys. Uh, in like the get back era but done in the style of the beatles cartoon yeah, yeah. and yeah. and so so yeah that was just like another little you know collection of pieces that i made and actually you know it's a running theme with me that i do these kind of collections of paintings and mm -hmm. whether it's like in memorial paintings or you know muppets or beatles or something like that and uh, i actually have a upcoming show in march mm -hmm. at 
the ATAC, the Ann Arbor Arts oh. Center. Um, and it will be uh, soft collection shows of uh, my watercolor. So. Oh, nice. Oh, that's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Cool. That'll be cool to see. I was just going to, I was just wondering if, yeah, if you had plans to, uh, to show these or um, display them. That's nice. Yeah. I love this one. I, I hadn't made the connection to the, uh, this other Beatles cartoon, but now I see it for sure. I think I was still thinking of uh, the Muppet style, which I think mm -hmm. is probably just uh, his coat he's wearing here, which I can picture oh, from, totally. from the, uh, from the special. His coat might as well have been a Muppet and get yeah. back on yeah. that rooftop performance yeah. for sure. Um, and then some other posters. I think it's just it's just really interesting, and I want to make sure to share you know all the different styles you do. I think that that's cool. Um, so here's two you know two posters from around. These are both from around the same time as the two bang posters on the previous slide, but very different styles. These look like um, some more more digital work. Can you talk a bit about the technique on these ones? Uh, so the sword poster. Um... That was a hand-drawn poster. Uh, th this one was really interesting. This was a hand-drawn pen and ink poster. Mm -hmm. And then I also added ink washes to it. Again, I was talking about ink washes mm -hmm. before where you dilute India ink. So uh, there is a grayscale version of this poster. Uh -huh. um, and so what I did was uh, I drew it in all pen and ink uh, before the ink washes. I scanned that in and then I added the uh the ink washes to it scan that in again uh and then i kind of combined the two in the computer and then that's where i like added color so you can mm -hmm. see in like the clouds like there's you know some nice gradients and stuff in the waves there's like different layers of gradients and that's yeah. all because of the the ink washes oh, wow. um absolutely you could do that on a tablet um but i actually really like the organic way that the ink washes were like lending to the art and I'm not even sure that I was working on a tablet that much at the, at that point when I made that. So, so that was that poster, uh, the John Carpenter poster. Uh, he's one of my favorite filmmakers uh, that show at in at uh, the Masonic Temple in Detroit uh, was amazing. He's he's a he's a unique filmmaker because he you know he 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 directs from his own scripts and he composes his own scores, mm -hmm. and so uh, in his retirement he started to uh, play a lot more music with his son and his godson and they went on tour. And so it was a real bucket list for me to be able to do this poster. And uh, so, you know, that's, you know, that face is him. And then that collage of different um, characters and, uh, and scenes, uh, those are all from like his different movies. And uh, yeah, it was just a joy to be able to do that. And uh I think it's really interesting just looking at this stuff because I, I, there was such a long period of time where I just embraced using as much black as possible in my, in my artwork. Um, like I, I would say that, you know, I, it was a knock against me because, you know, not many people want to put, there's a specific group of people that want to put stuff with black backgrounds and like really high contrast stuff on their walls and um so yeah it's it i i think it's i think it's fascinating to see you know these kind of polar opposites between you know super heavy contrasty stuff with like very light you know soft touch that i'm far more drawn to now yeah yeah that's great did you sneak any uh ghost of mars uh, uh there. there is ghost of mars on there nice. somewhere but i don't know where <laughs> <laughs> so like when i'm full spectrum then when i met john uh one of the times i met john and i showed him this poster he was very confused he was just oh. like, who's that and i was just like that's from escape from new york you know and he's <laughs> like okay <laughs> he's just, he's, i yeah. love him but he's kind of a grump <laughs> he's such an interesting uh interesting character for sure he just yeah. like, plays a lot of video games now and oh total Thanks loves there. video games loves basketball loves getting checks for yeah. doing nothing like yeah it's... i think i pretty i'm saying he's fine with them uh continuing to remake halloween as long as you know the checks keep coming absolutely i respect it um and then yeah another poster and sort of a different you know kind of like you're saying the the dark black and dark black background this almost to me kind of feels like more like the same 
touch of your watercolors almost just the white background and very light is this from around mm -hmm. the same i mean i guess we can place when this was from i assume uh okay. no this is a, this is a good uh this is a good like midway midway yeah. point between the last slides and now because i think that this was made uh you know this was made you know a year or so before the pandemic yeah, um amazing. yeah and um yeah, I really wanted to go for that kind of uh, 60s, um, this commercial pop art um, mm -hmm. that had uh, a lot of colors with just like thin lines separating them. And uh, so it was a very specific kind of aesthetic that I was kind of going for. But you're totally right. Like this is it's this is kind of like me setting the scene for what's to come later. Yeah. For sure. And this was like an official poster for the Bernie oh. Sanders campaign. Uh, you know, it, it honored to be able to do that. Love, love that Bernie. And, yeah. uh, and yeah. It's yeah. Thanks. Like thanks. So, yeah. And thanks so much to uh, Aaron Draplin, the designer for uh, pulling me onto that project. Nice. Uh, uh, yeah. I owe that homie a hug whenever I see him next. Yeah. That was such, such an interesting um, campaign for many reasons, but one just the way that they pulled in artists and musicians and you know had had you know great artists and bands and things all the rallies and just really uh interesting uh interesting you know another way to highlight community which is really very great. much so yeah um yeah this reminds me kind of like a pushpin studios kind of look too mm. mm -hmm. um and then yeah so then like that clear clearly kind of goes you can almost even see in the blue and pink shadows mm into some mm -hmm. of the other, um, you know, political work. Yeah, so that John Lewis one, um, gosh, I mean, that that's one of the first watercolors that I did. Oh yeah. Uh, I can't, it'd be interesting to like track back which one, but that was one of the first ones. And, um, you know, it was, you know, upon his passing and really kind of wanted to have that, you know, strong, but kind of, you know, ghostly kind of uh, feel to it. And I think that it really does kind of lend, it sets a stage for the type of um, palette that I've been using mm -hmm. um, ever since, like lots of blues and, and purples, and then, you know, contrasted with like warm colors. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, the, the Dana Nessel one, that's, that's just, you know, embracing the the blues and purples, and yeah. uh, you know, there's there's a little bit of uh, you know, uh, soft warm tones down in there somewhere, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, and it's interesting because I'm 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 I've only been doing watercolor for a few years. Uh, I'm still learning, and I'm still struggling at times too because there are mm -hmm. times where I'll try and paint something and I'll have it in my head that I want it to look like something. Um, but you know, watercolor isn't made to look like acrylic or oils or, you know, mm -hmm. I have, I have many favorite artists and, you know, that's, that's not what watercolors are actually, you know, made, they're not made to look like a movie poster. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so there are times where I'm just like, oh, I just wanted to look like this and it, it can't. So there are some times where like Dana Nessel, where, you know, I just tried to like pare it down to just like a few colors and just trying to make it uh, easy and manageable. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of working within those limitations. Yeah. And embracing them. Mm -hmm. um, got a few comments mm. in the chat here. We got some smiley heart face emoji from Jeremy, some hands up emojis from Sanamar. Mm. Got a few bang fans apparently Lauren and Jamie again. Mm. And uh Jennifer says way to go Jeremy you're a rock star. So no. thanks. thanks for the comments. Feel free to keep them coming. If we don't get to them right away, we'll pass them along when we can. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, so a few more watercolors um I like these contrast to the other one just kind of showing the other side in terms of you know politics back to pop culture but also these are very warm um mm -hmm. just you know going from that in an essel the blues to this uh gwyneth paltrow which is just uh such a uh you know such a change but also there are some mm -hmm. those cool shadows in there but this yellow and the red and orange is really pop mm -hmm. 
Uh, so yeah, these were part of, well, first, thanks. Uh, uh, that's nice of you to say that. Um, but uh, these are a part of a Wes Anderson series. Again, we're going to go back to collections. I have a yeah. whole... Um, I have a whole ser Wes Anderson series that I've been developing over the past uh, six months or so. In fact, you'll be able to see a lot of them at oh, the nice. uh, A2AC show in March. And so, yeah, the fantastic Mr. Fox and, you know, Mrs. Fox. Uh, I, I love I loved being able to uh, kind of like find like an interesting midway between cartoon and like realistic for them. Um, and oddly enough, I think that uh, I think it, like I got pretty close to how they look with watercolor, which is, you know, um, which I was really happy with. Mm -hmm. And uh, but again, like approaching it, like there's, like I'm not trying to go photorealistic and there's always going to be parts of it that mm -hmm. um, I stylize. And so mm -hmm. their bodies are stylized. You know, Gwyneth Paltrow is, that's a very graphic look while also being yeah. like very soft. Mm -hmm. And I really like, you know, the dichotomy between uh, the two of those. Yeah. And, and as well as like having focal points, I think that focal points are really important for me with watercolor mm -hmm. eyes are like the main, main thing. Like I always want to draw your attention to the eyes and, you know, with Gwyneth, it was easy Royal Tenenbaums. She has that, you know, liquid eyeliner, it yeah. pops. And then, um, yeah, the same with the foxes. Yeah. That's kind of funny. Though. That's the, the through line between these, even though they're, you know, puppets and uh, mm -hmm. that person. Totally, totally. Um, and then a few more. It was interesting going through your, uh, you know, the, the images you sent in your website as well, especially these watercolors as you've been talking. It is almost like, you know, looking at a, I don't know, like a year end highlights or, you know, Time Magazine year end seeing these by what you choose to paint, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. figures that have passed or things in the news or things that are released. And then also you talking about, you know, your role with the Ann Arbor Art Center doing social media and promotions and things. Mm -hmm. It's some of that reminded me of like, like I remember when you posted these images online from the movie um, Prey, the Predator prequel, mm -hmm. it's just uh, interesting seeing, you know, you almost using your artwork to promote things you like and things you want people to make sure they're aware of and know about. And totally, totally. Yeah, I think that goes back to, you know, I was a movie writer for 12 years at the mm -hmm. old movie guide. Um, I worked mm -hmm. in video stores. I worked in record stores. Um, I, I have, you know, uh, uh, you know, past, uh, I have a past with being a DJ. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have this, these like uh, footholds in entertainment media and it, it's, it's just like part of me. I can't really mm -hmm. shake it. Yeah. And especially if I see something that I'm really passionate about. And, you know, you could say the same thing about, uh, you know, politics yeah. now for sure. Um, but if I see something that I'm really passionate about, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great excuse for me to try and capture what I think is great about it and put it out there so that, yeah. you know, and, and try and get other people to watch it too, you know, praise a great movie. We were talking about it earlier. Like yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a fantastic period predator action survival adventure and uh, starring an all, you know, uh, Native American cast. It has a Comanche um, uh, dub that you can watch, which is really, really fascinating and um, and unique and worthy to have mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. And so, yeah, I painted these pieces uh, here, a complex gallery in L.A., the gallery. Um, I work with the most, love them. Um, shout out to Adam over there. Uh, they've released these as prints. And so nice. I'm actually, uh, I have a good handful of uh, new work coming from them pretty soon in the next couple of weeks with them. So be on the lookout there. Nice. Um, we're at the 130 mark. I want to make sure we have time for your demo. So we're going to get into- um... Plenty of time. Um, a few of your actually we got a couple of questions here um, mm -hmm. and maybe you'll get into this during the demo but that never hurts to repeat um, what kind of watercolor paper do you use 
Um, I use a uh, Strathmore um, hot press, though I'm getting, uh, I've got like a whole batch of cold press that I'm uh, looking forward to getting uh, to uh, starting. Uh, I do a lot of work on um, this watercolor greeting card paper. Because one of the things that uh, I was doing during the pandemic were was I was painting pictures for people and uh, sending sending them cards in the mail. Mm. I thought it was a great way to keep in touch with people and um, mm -hmm. uh, did a lot of Christmas cards. And I'll talk about that. Um, oh, yeah. But, you know, this paper you can get on. Uh, you can get on Amazon. What's interesting about it is that it's got like hot press on one side. So it's, it's like pretty tooty. Um, you probably can't see it, but, uh, but then on the other side, it's a lot more smooth. And so it's, it's interesting, like going back and forth. Um, and I really do like painting on the smooth surface better. Um, especially with washes. I really love like really flat washes and something that I've worked hard to try and nail down. Um, so yeah, you can buy a, like a pack of 50 watercolor greeting cards on on Amazon. Uh, I, I believe that there's Strathmore. Um, and uh, yeah, and then you can send cards to your, you know, friends and family. In fact, at the Art Center, we have an art box where you can, um, uh, it comes with like uh, a set of watercolor note cards, uh, as well as like paints and brushes and stuff. Um, so you can, you know, Buy a box from the art center and, you know, do some painting on your own and then send out some cards to people. Yeah, which definitely seems like a, um, you know, a worthy place to buy a buy art supplies from. Yeah. Those who could cause. Support uh, nonprofits. Yeah. Um, and then Terry asked, with the textures and colors, when thinking about displaying slash framing these works, still the mm. basic gallery blacks, or have you thought about alternate display? Hmm. Yeah, again, this is something that you and I talked about before we yeah. went on. Um, I, I I like to frame things in uh, my watercolor in white frames. Mm -hmm. I find that black frames tend to overpower the watercolors. You know, the watercolors are so soft. And, you know, if you put a black frame against a watercolor, it's just going to eat up your eyes. Whereas, like, you, you kind of, you, you there's a way of, like, expanding the canvas mm -hmm. with the white canvas if you put it in a white frame which just draws your eye just right to that to that uh painting so and again it's like focal points you know i work so hard to have a focal point um that i i don't want anything else to kind of take away from that mm -hmm. yeah and you might have mentioned this um but again never hurts to repeat do you have a specific date for your show in march um it should be up all throughout march but i don't have a specific date lined up yet but i'm pretty sure that it will be up throughout most of the month of march okay stay tuned all right so then we wanted to talk a little bit about your um inspirations mm -hmm. and one of the first artists you mentioned to me was uh bill said bill Sinkevich. Sinkevich. Yep. Sinkevich. Yes. Yeah. Um, who is an artist that um, I was clearly not familiar with by name, but definitely recognized seeing these all throughout uh, my childhood and teenhood on comic book covers and in posters and comic book shops and mm -hmm. um, magazines and things. Um, but just tell us a little bit about what it is about uh, this artist that you like. Uh, you. Bill is a he's a lifelong inspiration for me. I grew up with comics, uh, again, media, right. Entertainment. This is, it's just all baked into me. Right. And, um, Bill's really interesting because he has a commercial art background. Uh, he, um, you know, he, he started his work in, in the seventies and then really came into his own in the eighties. And, um, he brought a fine art touch to comic books that really wasn't there before. And, uh, and and wasn't there in, in, in such a prominent way. And, you know, these pieces, these, you know, painted pieces that he has, um, there, you would see it on covers a lot in, mm -hmm. uh, in the 80s. And, um, 
but his interiors would be, you know, really wild, really stylistic, um, played a lot with different kinds of styles, different kinds of mediums and stuff. And, um, you know, so I've, I've always been a, a, a really big fan of his and he probably, you know, uh, ruined me in a way because I, I have very uh, distinct thoughts about um, a person's style and how uh, I'm, I'm drawn to very striking, very stylish art movies uh tv um if then something is like pretty flat uh, like i just can't be drawn to it and it's probably mm -hmm. bill's fault yeah. but um mm -hmm. uh but yeah and and so i and i also inspiring me to this day because he he does do a lot of watercolor work he still does a lot of uh pen and ink work mixed media work but he does he's known right he's known lately for his memorial pieces so i would be lying if i didn't say that like mm -hmm. i would inspired by him to do some of my hmm. memorial stuff interesting yeah yeah these these are these are great i'm excited to look into more of his work um and you also mentioned when we talked about you know what was in the dia's collection you mentioned chuck close which we have um not any of the large portraits um, but we've got a few this is a small print collage and watercolor mm -hmm. that you found so yeah uh you know through the years, we we found that you know Chuck is a little problematic. But when it um, when it comes down to it, you know, as I was looking through the DIA's collection, um, you know, Chuck Close, I, I never thought of it before, but he's absolutely one of the reasons that I'm so drawn to portraiture, because uh, Chuck is known for doing these oversized, large scale uh, portraits of people. And in many different styles and all, all sorts of different styles. And um, you can't miss them when you see them in, uh, in a museum. You, you, they, uh, I, you know, they bring me to tears. I, I first saw them in Pittsburgh when I went to school there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I, anytime I see them uh, again, I, you know, I'll stand there for <laughs> probably too long. Uh, looking at it because I, I just can't it's 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 overpowering in in such a good way in such a good moving way um and so um so yeah i i'm, I'm very uh very respectful of his work um and uh but i also know that you know they're you know he's a you know a a a uh a problematic human being on some levels how about that <laughs> yeah um megan clark added in the chat march 11th to march 26th with an open oh look at that seven nice so very first, nice which is a uh, that's saint patrick's day so uh that'll be a Ooh. fun time in downtown ann arbor i'm sure oh yeah yeah um speaking of being green uh mm -hmm. we've got our Kermit the Frog here, which is kind of what we've been talking about all along. And one of the things um, you mentioned right when we first talked about this talk, and this is the um, Kermit the Frog puppet, uh, which is a prototype on display, or not in the collection at the DIA. It is not on display at the moment. Um, but this is something that is um, pretty interesting that's in the collection. And this is from 1969, so really pretty early. And this was a gift. Um, a gift to the museum from Jim Henson himself in uh, 1971. So only a few years after Sesame Street had premiered, uh, but well before the Muppet Show had premiered and Kermit was kind of the uh, household name he is today. Mm -hmm. And this, yeah, game... this, one, oh. this one's fascinating. I mean, you look at the, the collar. I mean, he's got a double collar. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's, it's wild to, to, to see that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he's definitely in an early Kermit. There's there's much earlier Kermits, you know, uh, dating uh, almost two decades. Um, but this is a this is a fascinating, you know, bridge between um, the 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 Kermit in the fifties to uh, the Kermit, you know, Sesame Street and Muppet Show and everything that we that we know. But that double mm -hmm. collar is fascinating. I can't yeah. wait to see him in person next time he's yeah. on display. Yeah. Um, I think this was last on display right before um, the shutdown in uh, early 2020. I remember seeing it. Um, I have I have 
a vivid memory of like a stanchion in the museum or like a sign in the museum that had like an arrow pointing forward and said like, you know, board meeting or director's dinner, or like some fancy sounding thing. And then to the left was Kermit, just, mm. just letting people know where he was. That's great. Um, but I love too seeing this, you know, I had a, one of my earliest Muppet memories is, you know, I grew up on the Muppet Babies cartoon and reruns of mm -hmm. the show. And uh, I had a stuffed Kermit that looked, you know, not too dissimilar from this with little Velcro hands that could wrap around you. And when my, you know, probably if one you've got there, yeah. Yeah, but, um, got little yeah. Velcro hands, yep. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, there's mm -hmm. the different color too. But it's, yep, I like totally. seeing, you know, something I'd never even considered, but seeing this, uh, the label on this cloth, foam, rubber, metal rods and plastic, like thinking about this puppet being not just something you find at KB Toys or see on TV, but an actual art object that mm. someone thought of, someone made, someone created. And then what it, what it went on to be is a really interesting thing to kind of sit in. Yeah, even yeah. that pose, you don't really see that pose um, mm -hmm. with a lot of the Kermits that are on display these days. Yeah, sitting more of like kind of like frog leg style mm -hmm. maybe versus, you know, the totally. long gangly Kermit we would think of yeah. now sitting on a shelf like yours. Yeah, cool stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So with that, I think we're going to get to um, the demo portion. So I'm going to close out of this. If you have any more comments, um, feel free and we'll pass them along or questions. And Jeremy's going to now do a little watercolor color demo for the next 18 minutes or however long it takes. All right, let me get this uh, set up here. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, all right, so with watercolor, um, I do like to work with like the same palettes over and over again. Uh, I recently uh, graduated to a much bigger palette, but I went back and got the same palette that um, that I used to use for uh, these holiday Kermits that I painted for people um, for Christmas uh, last year. I painted like 50 of these things. So I got to be able to like get it down pretty quickly on uh, how fast I could do it. So um, I'm not too worried about the time here. Um, but so you'll see, I've got a couple different blues, a couple different greens, one yellow, one red, and then I have a couple of darker colors. I have a, a warmer dark and a darker dark. And let me um, let me just mix these up, get these mixed up again. And I'll put them on my tester sheet. So I've got a darker uh, green here. I've got a lighter green here. I've got a darker blue. I've got a lighter blue. And I, I always like to have these little tester sheets. Um, always good to, you know, test out your paints before you put them on the paper. So here's a red. Let's get a yellow going on here. And now these shadows. So we have a cold shadow. It's like a it's like a darker uh, darker blue, and we have a warmer shadow that's like a warmer red. So uh, paints are prepped. Time to paint. All right, let's go. We got Kermit here with a little hat and I got a little wreath going on. So I am going to start out. I'm gonna put down a fairly large wash for what I'm painting. Um, and I'm gonna split it up into a couple different colors and get them to blend together, which is like a really uh, fun thing about watercolors is that you can blend colors and you know, there's there's a bit of chaos involved uh, as to how it's going to dry, which is really exciting, actually. So with Kermit, I like to let's get some more light in on that. So with Kermit, I like to go in with a yellow, yellow on one side of his face, 
move the brush around. You don't want you don't want anything to dry. You want to keep the edges wet when you're painting. And then I'm going to go in with a little green. Again, just like trying to get those edges so that they don't dry on me. As soon as like watercolor dries and you try and put another uh, color um, next to it or attached to it, like it definitely will dry differently. So you want to be very aware of your edges and you want to be aware, you want to kind of move around and make sure that you are That's a little bit too much. So just pull it off with your brush. That's something fun that you can do with watercolor is that you can kind of pull off certain things. There we go. So there, we got a nice, nice wash, nice blended wash that's happening here. Um, so I'm going to continue, I'm gonna let that dry and I'm gonna continue down to the collar here. And again, I'm gonna do yellow. Uh, one thing about watercolors is I like to have like a pretty um, locked in, um, locked in pencils before I start painting because again, I like to paint pretty fast. And as soon as I start making stuff up, I, I kind of lose it. Um, it doesn't come out as well. So I like to have everything kind of laid out, do the footwork before you start painting. That's like a big thing with watercolors. Um, always have like a little piece of paper that you can, um, that you can pick up some paint dry off your brush when needed. Okay, so while that's drying, it's gonna go over to the red. And uh, again, this whole thing is going to be red. So um, I don't wanna use like a small brush to do that. Um, you want to be able to, um, you wanna be able to, um, you know, use the right brush for the right area that you're filling in. So with this one, again, I'm gonna go in pretty wet, which is fine. Move around, make sure that those edges don't dry out. And the thing with like a big brush is that like you're gonna have, it's gonna stay more wet on the paper with a big brush. Um, the smaller the brush that you have, like the less time that you're going to have, um, the less dry time and the less time that you'll have to like mess with it. All right, got that red in. Now I'm gonna go in with a light blue. And again, I'm just kind of working around the, uh, the canvas. And if we have like a yellow, if we have a yellow lighter side on this side and a darker side on this side, then I'm gonna start putting some uh, shadows. Let's pick up some of that. And you can even like dab a little bit. So I'll do some heavy shadows on this side. And you know, you can even like, you know, take the paint off of your brush and kind of dry brush, you know, what's there, kind of move that around. All right. While that dries, I am going to go in with a fine brush here. I'm gonna start putting in, actually, I'm gonna do a semi-fine brush. And I'll put in cool shadows, cool shadows. I want these pupils to be 
um, kind of the darkest thing in this painting. So that's why I'm doing, I'm using the cool shadows and I'm just gonna plop in just a little bit more just to make sure. Okay, good, good. All right, moving on to the mouth. I'm gonna do another one of those um, where I merge two colors together. So the bottom of the mouth, I have red. Actually, get. I'm gonna get that. Now I'm gonna go to the blue, dark blue. I'm just gonna start making that blend together. I'll fill in the rest. All right. And I'm going to add some accents. Then put some wrinkles in here like that and I'm gonna add dark blue into on top of the lighter blue and I do a lot of layering with uh, with watercolor um, and that's why I do like to have like a range of value with my colors. Um, and in fact, it probably goes back to, um, it probably goes back to ink washes and it probably goes back to screen printing, honestly, because uh, with those you are, you are layering one thing on top of another thing on top of another thing until it's all done. Um, yeah. I like to, Get in a little contrast. And again, if I wouldn't have waited, let's see, I get a little bit of blue. If I wouldn't have waited for the yellow to dry and I put a blue right next to it, it would have bled right through there. So you don't want that. Okay. So now uh, I am going to add. Do a little work on this wreath. And, and this is kind of like a paint by numbers kind of a thing, you know? Um, if you are a skilled illustrator, um, and even if you if you can trace too, I mean, whatever gets you to the final product is A-OK -okay in my book. Um, so, you know, if you want to trace an image, just as long as it's not somebody else's art, um, but if you want to like trace an image, um, just so that you have your, um, you know, your outlines and then you can practice like filling it in and it's great. Ooh, and look at that. I think I nudged that blue a little bit, which is fine because we'll just... Throw some more on there and might as well get that darker anyway. Who cares? And throw a little red in there. And let's have that mushroom. I like these like these like blossoms that happen with the um, with the paint. And one thing, another thing about watercolor is that like it's always going to unless you're you're using like a lot of pigment it's always going to dry softer than it looks when you put it down so sometimes you can put down a color and just be like oh that's so bright that's that's way too dark and then you know a few minutes later next thing you know like it's turned soft and nice and and you're just like oh that was fine. I didn't have to worry about it. All right, so I'm almost done with this wreath here. 
being kind of loose with it. There's a lot of botanical watercolor artists out there that are, that are amazing. I'm, I'm not one. Um, in fact, I don't really like to use the color green that much, uh, to be honest. Um, but it works in this case. All right. Um, while that's drying, I am going to fill in. Let's get again. If I'm filling in these berries, I don't want a big brush. I want a smaller one. And let's just fill in these berries. Again, we're going to do highlight coming from this side. Uh, I really, some, some watercolor artists love to use just like one brush and they are like, I only have to use this brush. It's so sharp and all this kind of stuff. And it's great for them. I think it's really important to find what works for you. For me, I really like the precision of having smaller brushes. Um, and as you can see, it's already drying there. This one, this stuff is still wet. In fact, I'm going to add to it just uh even that out a little bit. Uh, but this is already drying, which is awesome. Because I'm gonna have to put my hand over it pretty soon. And we'll see if I smudge it. We should take bets. This is looking great. I'm I'm back to give you a, a three minute warning or so. We also got a few thanks in the comment. Thanks, this is great. Thanks for sharing. Um, it's been very uh, fun watching watching you paint and hearing the explanations and just kind of mm. seeing, seeing it come along. It's very, very relaxing. All right, three minutes. I can do this. <laughs> so now I'm going to go in with my uh, warm shadows on one side. Getting a little looser because of time, but that's fine. Do you ever um, mix your media, so to speak? Like, do watercolor then add other elements, or do you do you pretty much? Uh... Um, I've used gouache before, which is a type of watercolor. Right, right. right. Um, it's definitely like more opaque. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I haven't done too much. Um, I know like some people will go in and do like a, uh, some people will go in and do like pencils afterwards, colored mm -hmm. pencils. There's like watercolor pencils. Like I yeah. haven't messed with that yet. Um, but it's a little heavy. Oh, look at that. Got to uh, love your work. Got to appreciate the tutorial. I'm inspired. And that's kind of always the goal here. Is we, hey, you know, awesome. It's, it's uh, all of these demos we've done, these studio visits throughout the past couple of years. Um, I always love hearing what artists have to say and seeing their studios and seeing them work. Um, but when people say that they're, you know, inspired to uh, pick up their watercolors or go out and buy a set of watercolors, that's, you know, always so nice to hear. Um, yeah. Well, and, you know, thing with watercolor, you just have to work at it. Mm -hmm. There are a million tutorials on YouTube. Check them out. See what works for you. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, have fun. And there's, and there's so many styles of watercolor, too. You know, mm -hmm. even, like, yours are even when it's kind of cartoony, it's very precise and uh, very um, precise, I guess is the word, even when it's, you know, meant to look like a cartoon or a puppet. But, you know, mm -hmm. watercolors can also be very loose and messy and abstract and just fun to work with and very expressionistic. Mm -hmm. which I know that's one thing a lot of people like about them too, which you've talked about a bit, even in this is just kind of seeing 
within the tight uh, guidelines of your drawing where those blends happen, where those colors blossom, where they mm -hmm. fall is, is kind of the fun of it for sure. Yeah, very much so. And so, you know, I'll call him done. Why not? <laughs> so there you go. There's, there's your, there's your right. festive holiday Kermit for me uh, to great. all of you. That is great. Um, yeah, and hopefully some of you are inspired to, you know, go out and this is a, I think what you were saying about getting some watercolor cards and sending them out. That's great. Like mm -hmm. who wouldn't love to get a, a, a card in the mail? I think it's a great exactly. thing to do, especially in this, this day and age. Yeah. Uh, reach out and, you know, reach out and write somebody a letter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. We have put your website on the uh, screen a couple of times. You're also pretty, uh, easy to find on Instagram, uh, check out the Ann Arbor Art Center's website and also their Instagram page. Um, keep an eye out for that show at the Ann Arbor Art Center. March 17th is the opening run from the 13th or the 11th to the 26th. Um, and yeah, thanks Jeremy. Thanks for hanging out with us this afternoon. It was great. Uh, thanks so much, Zach. It's really cool. Great to see you. And yeah. uh, thanks to the DIA. All right, we'll talk soon. All right. All right. And thank you all for joining and watching. Uh, like I said, this is our last studio visit as we're kind of pivoting and focusing on in-person stuff. Reminder that the museum is free to visit. Uh, if you live in the Tri-Counties, a lot of great exhibits up right now, um, including some from artists that we've chatted with, Tana Bowie and Judy Bowman, um, are up in the print exhibit right now. Definitely recommend checking that out. Go back onto our YouTube page and check out all the past studio visits and say hi next time you're at the museum. Thanks.